I had been depressed since my wife left me. At the time, she was working long hours at the law firm where she had ambitions to be a partner. I worked from home writing content for a digital marketing agency. I had thought that everything was fine. And then she told me out of the blue that she had met someone new. Someone with drive and ambition. I had those things I told her I just needed a break. But her mind was made up and by the end of that horrible day she had moved out of our apartment and taken her things with her. I was devastated. She had been the one and the love of my life. For the first few dreadful weeks after that I kept expecting her to message me and tell me that it had all been a mistake. But my phone was silent as I sat staring at the television with the curtains drawn. I lived off junk food, stopped showering, and wrote email blasts without really seeing the words that I was typing. Weeks drifted into months. I never went out anymore, I ordered everything that I needed online. One Saturday morning I dragged myself out of bed late and looked around listlessly at the dirty clothes strewn across the floor. The remains of my midnight stacks were scattered among them. It was disgusting and I didn't care. I leaned over to find something to put on and saw a rustle of movement among the mess. It was a rat and it was looking right at me. I swore and stumbled backwards. My feet got tangled in clothes and I fell. The rat just watched me freaking out and then ambled away as if it hadn't a care in the world. I sat there, my heart beating way too fast, and decided that things had to change. I was like a man possessed. I cleaned myself and the apartment from top to bottom. I filled two dozen refuse sacks with empty takeaway boxes. I mopped and vacuumed the floors. I scrubbed the sinks and the work surfaces. And I even threw away some clothes that had gotten mold on them and were beyond washing. The rest I laundered and ironed and folded. Now, I had snapped out of my downer, I could not believe how disgusting that I had let things get. Feeling a lot better already, I left the apartment and went to the Whole Foods store and stocked up on ingredients for healthy meals. After a bowl of organic porridge, I turned to my laptop. While I was on a roll, the next thing that I wanted to do was meet someone. I typed in a search for online dating, and I hit a problem. After sifting out the sites that struck me as dubious because they immediately wanted my credit card details and other frankly seedy websites, I made a start by filling in my personal details on one of the genuine portals for singles like me. This was simple enough at first. In some ways, it wasn't that different to applying for a job. When it came to interests, I had to embellish things a bit. My hobbies had been eating junk food while staring blankly at the television and missing my wife. But I couldn't enter that in the relative boxes. And so I wrote that I enjoyed a fine dining and classic movies instead. These still felt a bit weak, but I could always go back and improve them. And besides, this was just the first of a number of sites that I was going to use to get myself back out there. My personal profile almost completed, I clicked on next, and that's when things went astray. The website wanted me to upload images of myself, but the only images that it would accept were ones that were already on my social media sites. Social media was not somewhere that I wanted to be. There were lots of pictures of me and my ex-wife. I knew that seeing any of these would open up old wounds. And much worse than that, I might see what my ex-wife was doing now. While I was wallowing, she would have been posting about her new life. Her new love. Feeling sick, I went to close the website and without adding any images. A pop-up message appeared asking, Are you sure you want to leave the site? You won't be able to find romance. Feeling a horrible mix of anger and depression, I exited the site. I tried another three similar sites but always reached a point where I was reminded of the past that I was trying to leave behind. Online dating was a nightmare and there was no way that I could deal with it. My shoulders slumped. 
the pizzerias that I used to order from on a daily basis would be open. An app on my phone could see a three cheese stuffed crust mega meal heading my way with a couple of taps. The thought of gorging myself was so tempting, but I knew that if I succumbed, it would be a bad backward step. I decided that was not going to happen. I closed the laptop and for the first time in my life, I went for a run. I didn't have any running gear to change into, I just set off in the clothes that I was wearing. I made it to the end of the block before I ground to a halt with my hands on my knees, gasping for breath. I was fine with that, it was still a win. Once I had caught my breath, I decided to go for a leisurely stroll rather than heading straight back to my apartment. I passed a row of independent shops. One of them was for donated goods that were sold for charity. A sign in the window read, Volunteers Wanted. That gave me an idea. Back at home, I opened my laptop up and typed in a search for voluntary work. I figured this would be a great way to meet someone new, with the added bonus of doing something helpful. I didn't see myself standing behind the counter in a shop, but there would be something out there that was right for me. The pages of links came up, and after making myself a coffee with low-fat milk and no sugar, I began to work my way through them. There were many deserving causes that appealed, and I sent off for more details about voluntary roles helping out an animal charity, cleaning up a park in the city center and working on a community garden. I was about to call it a day when my eye was caught by a search result at the bottom of the page. It read, Help save our fire tower. Now, I had heard of fire towers, but I had never seen one in real life. I was pretty sure they were a thing of the past, made redundant by modern technology, but I was intrigued enough to click the link. It took me to a website of a group who had bought an old fire tower. The tower had been closed down 40 years ago and left to fall into disrepair. The group wanted to renovate it and open it up as a tourist attraction. They were looking for people who could spend time at the fire tower working on the fixes. It sounded great and I sent them my details. I hoped they would get back to me straight away, when after a salad with wholemeal bread, I still hadn't heard back from them. I decided to fill time that evening by doing a bit of my own research. The group's site said the fire tower was located in a rural area on the outskirts of my home city. I typed in the location and went to an online image showing the fire tower from above. The fire tower itself showed as a speck in the middle of the forest. Presumably, it had been the forest that had been monitored for signs of a fire back in the day. On the city side of the forest, the trees eventually thinned out and the grounds of large houses began to dominate the landscape. I wasn't interested in seeing swimming pools, tennis courts, and helipads, so I moved the view away from the city out over the fire tower and deeper into the forest. The treetops spread across my screen in a beautiful display of nature and then the image blurred. All I could make out were vague shapes. Assuming the problem was my laptop, I cleared my cache and turned it on and off again, which was as far as my technological know-how stretched. None of this helped though. The image was still blurred. And so I moved the view ten miles along and the details returned. I could see open countryside, a farm, and what could have been a tractor. I kept looking in all directions and soon realized there was nothing wrong with my laptop or the internet. Instead, bizarrely, there was an area of land which was not showing. If I had been into conspiracy theories, I would have thought that it had been censored. That, for some disturbing reason, ordinary people like me were not allowed to see what was down there. I yawned and rubbed my face. Somehow it was almost midnight. I had lost myself down a rabbit hole and was thinking strange thoughts. I smiled wildly to myself. This was definitely another sign that I needed to get out more. I closed the tabs on my computer, ending up with just my emails and was pleased to see that I had a reply from the administrator at the fire tower group. 
It said that the group would be delighted for me to join them on site, renovating the fire tower, and added that they were holding the social event at a city center bar on Sunday evening. I'd be welcome to come along and meet some of the members of the group. I replied that that sounded fantastic and that I would see them there. That night, I slept better than I had in what felt like a very long time. The following evening, in my now orderly bedroom, I chose a fashionable casual shirt and a pair of slacks. I gave my smartest shoes a polish and put some gel in my hair. And that was me ready to go to the bar and meet up with the fire tower group. As I sat on the subway, I must admit my stomach was churning with nerves. I was so out of practice with socializing and this mattered to me. Telling myself that it was going to be fine, I watched the stops go by. The bar was just around the corner from the subway station. It was pretty much empty apart from a group of people sitting around a table in the corner, which I figured must be the fire tower folk who had come along for the social event. Hoping that I could remember how to have an actual conversation with people in real life rather than on screen, I strolled over. It turned out that I had nothing to worry about. The members of the fire tower group were welcoming and chatty. They were a mixed bunch. One of them, Mike, was a retired firefighter, though he was quick to point out that he had spent his career at the inner city station and had never been near a fire tower professionally. There was an accountant, Jeff, who also handled the admin for the group as a registered voluntary organization. An Alan who worked in PR and another Alan who worked in retail. There were a couple of university students, Tony and Nick, and there was Beth. Beth was about my age and worked as a nurse. She had long dark hair and an infectious laugh. And as the evening progressed, all I wanted to do was talk to her. At one point, I was trying to tell her a story about something funny that had happened to me when I was a teenager, but I totally muddled up the story and ended up sitting there silently wishing that I had never opened up my mouth in the first place. Beth put her hand on my arm and said simply, It's going to be okay. I think she could tell that I had been going through a bad time and I had to fight against opening up to her about my marriage ending. As socially awkward as I was, even I knew that was a guaranteed way to put somebody that I had just met off liking me. I hoped, though, that one day soon I would be able to talk to Beth about the things that really mattered to me. I was feeling a strange mixture of uncomfortable and happy when Jeff said that he wanted to run through the Rota for the following weekend's visit to the fire tower. He and one of the Allens had been due to go along and spend the Saturday there. Unfortunately, neither of them could make it now and he asked if anybody else was available. Beth leaned over to me and said quietly, How about you? We can spend time working on the tower and get to know each other better. Heat spread through my cheeks and I grinned and replied, Yeah, sounds good to me. Beth raised her hand and told the group that we would be happy to step in. I spent the subway ride home in a happy daze. I had already met somebody that I really liked, who seemed to feel the same way about me. Back home, I was smiling as I fell asleep. The rest of the week passed far too slowly. I wrote copy for products that I thought were garbage and ignored messages from the bosses at the agency saying that they wanted all staff to start working from the office for at least three days a week. Not if I can help it, I thought, and created a folder called Job Search. Beth had given me her number in the bar, and I also kept starting to write messages to her, and then deleting them because they were far too long and far too eager. Play it cool, I told myself. And then a few hours later, I started composing another wordy text, which I deleted. Finally, Saturday morning arrived. I had hired a car for the drive out to the fire tower. After writing and deleting a dozen messages to Beth asking if I could have a lift, followed by a rambling explanation of why this would be great. I set off extra early to make sure that I wasn't late. Reaching the fire tower, I parked up in its shadow. 
Craning my neck to look up, I was impressed. It was a simple and sturdy, appearing wooden construction with legs that reached high into the sky, supporting an observation deck. A ladder was the only way to reach the deck. The ladder did not look as sturdy as the rest of the fire tower, and the thought of climbing it filled me with unease. But I had to or else what would Beth think of me? I took a deep breath and tried to compose myself before she arrived. Wondering if she had sent a message with her ETA, I checked my phone, but I had nothing. So I could either wait for Beth to get there or I could overcome my fears in private and climb up to the deck. If I chose the latter, it wouldn't matter then how much I was grimacing or turning pale. I could be in the fire tower, appearing all confident and cool when Beth rocked up. I could tell her that the climb was a piece of cake. A decision made. I put a foot on the bottom rung and grabbed the sides and began to climb. The first half a dozen rungs were easy, and then I started to breathe harder and my muscles began to ache and sweat trickled down my face. My new diet had done wonders for me in recent days, but it hadn't wiped out months of being a slob. I was very unfit and not ready for this climb, but I was not going to turn back now. Thinking about Beth, how we had talked and had a good time, it spurred me on. Soon, sharp pains were flickering in my chest and my hands were so sweaty, I was worried about losing my grip. I paused, tightened my fingers around a rung and made a big mistake. I looked down. The ground loomed below so far away. I felt dizzy, felt the world around me begin to spin. I was going to fall, I was sure of it. I closed my eyes and gripped the ladder even tighter, and then dredging up enough willpower, I started ascending again. I kept my eyes closed and I felt my way, rung by endless rung upwards until my hand struck an obstruction. I opened my eyes and looked up. The base of the observation deck was inches away, and there was some kind of hatch blocking my way. If it was locked, I would have no choice but to go back down. A prospect, my exhausted limbs and stretched taut nerves couldn't face. I pushed into my relief. The hatch opened. Almost there, I thought, and I clambered upwards. And at last, I was through the hatch. I scrambled forwards on all fours and lay there on the floor of the deck, spread-eagled and gasping for breath and laughing to myself all at the same time. I was so glad that Beth was not here to see this and so proud of myself. I had made it, the all-action hero in a fire tower. Feeling shaky with the exertion, I got to my feet and I looked around. There was a lock on the hatch which could only be engaged from above. The floor of the deck appeared to me to be pretty secure. There was also a wooden safety barrier which ran around the edge of the whole deck and came up to my chest. Broken up wood, possibly once chairs and a table from when the fire tower was in active service, was piled in one corner. A roof which was supported by narrow pillars would give shelter, provided the wind and the rain were straight down, otherwise the deck was exposed to the elements. Thankfully, it was a fine summer's day, bright and clear and I could see for miles. I turned in a circle to take the view in. My mouth was probably hanging open in awe, but I didn't care. The trees stretched out for miles in every direction. I was above the canopy and could make out patches of open ground between the nearby trees. Trying to remember the online view that I had seen, I worked out that the large houses would be to the south. I couldn't see any of them, but expected that their rich owners would be in their home gyms or their home cinemas on a Saturday. The area that had been mysteriously blurred out would be to the north. I made a mental note to ask Beth if she knew what that was all about when she got there. Soon, I hoped too. This was the most beautiful view that I had ever seen in my life, and I wanted to share it with her. I wanted to tell her how happy I was to be there and how lovely she was. She might even look up at me and place a hand on my arm and then move in closer. We would kiss. 
and I smiled as my phone pinged with an incoming message. It was from Beth. Hey, the hospital called. I need to go into day to cover for a sick colleague, so I'm not going to make it out to the fire tower. I'm really sorry. I stared at the screen and sighed. So much for spending time with Beth and so much for my dreams of us kissing. I put my head in my hands and muttered, loser, and sat down. I rested my back against the barrier and stared up at the roof. Was it too much to ask, wanting to share my life with someone? The answer was a definite yes. I closed my eyes and hugged myself. Startled awake, shivered, I realized that I had fallen asleep and been dragged back into awareness by the sound of my phone ringing. I rubbed my face and looked at the screen. It was Beth calling. I answered with a hoarse, Hey. Hey you, she replied. I'm on my lunch break and I'm just calling to ask if you got the emergency alert. The authorities are telling everybody to stay indoors in an area that takes in the fire tower. They're saying it's a suspected chemical leak. If I got the alert, I had slept through it. Um, no, I grunted, still groggy. But you're on the road, right? Heading away from the fire tower, she asked. I climbed my feet. Uh, to be honest, no. I was shattered from climbing the ladder and then got your message and well. I was about to tell her how receiving her message had made me feel. How I had feelings for her, but something had caught my attention. A thick spiral of dark smoke was rising into the sky in the distance over to the north. Are you still there? Beth's voice broke back through. Yeah, I answered. It's just I'm still at the fire tower up in the observation deck and I think, I think I can see the source of the incident. There looks to have been some sort of accident over where the online map was blurred. It occurred to me that I should explain what I meant by this, but she was way ahead of me. Oh, Spookyville, she exclaimed. Tony and Nick are convinced there's a secret military facility over that way. I'm not so sure, but you should get down from the fire tower and get away. I looked over the edge of the barrier all the way back down to the ground. Uh, maybe I'd be better off staying here, I said thinking out loud. If there's a chemical leak, it could be safer to be higher. I'm not sure. Beth began, but once again my attention was caught by something else. I could see a figure on the ground stumbling in between the trees. I couldn't see them clearly because of the distance. But whoever it was, whatever was going on, they weren't out for a stroll in the woods. They were running away from something. I was convinced of it. I told Beth, There's something strange going on here. I'm going to hang up now and get a quick film and I'll send it to you. I disconnected before she got past saying the first couple of letters of my name. I was buzzing because Beth had cared about me enough to call. And I knew that we would be going for a drink to talk about the strange events at the fire tower really soon. Me and Beth as an item were very much back on the agenda. I held the phone up to catch the plume of smoke and then held it over the edge of the barrier to film the stranger on the ground, and I noticed that they weren't alone. There were three, no four figures, weaving their way along the forest floor. I held the phone out further, tried to click the focus and proved that I was a loser after all. I dropped the phone, watched it tumble down through the air. I lost sight of it in seconds, but it must have landed near one of the figures on the ground, because they stopped in their tracks and looked up, right at me. I stared in their direction as they moved towards the base of the ladder and began to climb it, which wasn't a problem, I told myself. Oh, what's that saying? Safety in numbers, yeah, that was it. And the other figures were following the first up the ladder. Maybe they had decided that being up in the fire tower could be safer. I had been thinking about that very thing moments earlier. Only now for reasons that I could not explain, I did not feel safe at all. I felt exposed, alone, and afraid. I went over to the open hatch and peered down. The leading figure was climbing much quicker than I had. 
They had already made it halfway up, which made me think they must not be suffering any ill effects from whatever had made them flee. But as I focused on them, I could see their clothes were dirty and their hair and skin. Their hands looked filthy as they grabbed rung after rung. My guts tightened another notch. I looked at the cover for the hatch. I thought about closing it and snapping the lock into place, but I couldn't do that. This man, I could see that it was a man now, was clearly not alright. Now that he was closer, I could make out that his skin was more than dirty. It was damaged. Open wounds were visible on the top of his hands. I definitely had to help him, not keep him away. Him and the others, below him, I could see the other figures frantically ascending the ladder. There weren't just three or four others now. There must to have been around ten of them. And the man who had first stepped onto the ladder was now only a dozen rungs away by now. He hadn't looked up yet, hadn't called out. He was just getting closer and closer. Close enough in a moment for me to reach down and grab his arm and help him up. Hey, you're almost there, I called down. Almost safe. I wanted to reassure him because that was the right thing to do, but I could hear the fear in my own voice. And instead of offering my hand, I looked down the hatch at the top of the man's head, saw that there were things moving on his scalp. Maggots, I realized. W what is wrong with you? I asked, my voice shaking. His only reply was to look up. Revulsion rushed through me. His face was a vision of terror. Wounds glistened on his forehead and cheeks. Flaps of gray skin hung down from the edge of the hideously damaged flesh. Part of his upper and lower lips were missing completely, and I could see the teeth beneath fixed in a horrifying grimace. One of his eyes shone darkly as he looked at me. The other was a hollow pit. Bile rose into the back of my mouth. My legs felt like they were about to give way. I was face to face with a nightmare and its hands were about to grip the sides of the hatch. In seconds, it would be on to the observation deck, followed by the others. I managed to break through the terror which had started to rob me of all sense and strength, and I slammed the hatch down with my foot, fell to my knees and snapped the lock into place. The hatch began to shake as the man the thing began to strike it. A sickening growling sound rose up towards me as well. It sounded like a rabid animal. More distorted, feral voices were raised in protest and the hatch rattled violently. As long as it holds, I'm safe, I thought, and began to pace the observation deck, desperately looking for another way down. But there was no escape from the horror enveloping me. More figures were streaming through the forest and I could no longer see the base of the ladder because it was covered in a writhing, growling mass of the things. Still, more came and tried to drag themselves up and over the bodies of their grotesque kin. They moved with a blind rage and in a flash, I understood what the creatures were. They were zombies, dead and crazed and trying to get to me. I shuddered as I thought what they would do if they got their hands on me. I glanced back at the hatch. Despite everything, it was still holding. I still had a chance. And then I saw some of the zombies were no longer trying to get onto the ladder. They were clamoring up the legs of the fire tower, some falling in their frenzy but others clinging on and crawling along the wood, getting closer and closer. A scream grew inside me as a ravaged hand appeared on top of the barrier, as a zombie rose into view. It glared at me, its eyes were bloodshot pools of anger, a low, furious growl drifted from its lips. Its face was whole, but as it mounted the barrier, I saw that its gut was an open wound. The gray slime of its intestines were revealed, as it lowered itself onto the observation deck and began to stagger towards me. I backed away and almost fell over the broken up furniture. There was nowhere else to go. And if I couldn't flee, then I had to fight. I picked up a chair leg, let loose the scream and ran at the zombie, 
and rammed the fragment of wood into its eye. The zombie cried out, staggered backwards, and then toppled to the floor and lay there motionless. Death had finally truly claimed it. I felt a rush of relief, a short-lived burst of hope that everything was going to be okay. And then I saw a second zombie was on the verge of scaling the barrier. I picked up another piece of wood and braced myself for the next attack. The zombie raised its arms and growled, and out of nowhere a sharp sound filled the air. The zombie collapsed on its face. Fresh blood decorated the back of its shattered head. More sharp sounds followed. The sounds of weapons being discharged, I realized, and lay flat as I could on the deck. It seemed that the cavalry had arrived, and I didn't want to end up as a casualty by accident. For what felt like a long time, the torrent continued. It was deafening, apocalyptic. But when it finally ceased, the hatch was no longer rattling, and there were no more zombies scrambling over the barrier. I crawled forward onto my belly and chanced to look over the barrier. The ground between the trees was covered in the remains of zombies. Soldiers were picking them up one at a time and throwing them into the back of trucks. Clean up time, I figured. I kept low and I kept quiet. I was going to wait until the military had finished clearing up the mess that presumably had originated in the secret facility and then head back down the ladder and hope that nobody had shot my hire car. The soldiers worked rapidly as what must have been NCOs barked orders at them, and soon the trucks were starting to pull away until there was just one jeep left, and two soldiers taking the final boxes. I didn't care about cover-ups by this point. I had survived, and at the end of the day that was all that mattered. And though it did not look like I was going to be able to sneak away. One of the soldiers was looking through the window of the hire car. Another was pointing up at the dock. Ah well, I thought. Don't sweat the details. All they would find up here was an innocent citizen and the remains of three zombies. A thought trickled through my brain. I had killed one zombie with the chair leg. The soldiers had taken out a second zombie. I turned slowly as the third zombie growled and lifted its head. I hadn't seen it make it onto the deck during the firing and it must have had enough sense left in its corrupted brain to lie low. A dead man playing dead, I thought, and a wave of hysteria rose through me. The zombie was in between me and the pile of makeshift weapons and there was no way the soldiers could get up that ladder quick enough. The zombie was standing upright now, swaying from side to side and was staring at me. I began to shuffle forwards. I held my hands up. Please, I begged impotently. Please don't hurt me. The zombie shuffled on. It was inches away from me, its fetid breath was hot against my skin. Its mouth opened. Drool hung in thick trails from its yellow teeth. Its decaying lips were almost touching mine. Not so long ago, I had been daydreaming about kissing Beth. Now I was in a zombie's rancid embrace. No! I yelled out at the top of my voice and started to push the zombie away. I started to run with my hand still pressed against its chest. Until we had reached the barrier and suddenly the zombie was toppling over it and falling to the ground. It landed with a sickening crunch head first on the roof of the hire car. The soldiers turned as one to see what had happened and then they looked up at me. One of them took aim. I raised my hands and shouted, I'm human. Instructions were shouted up for me to come down. Feeling shaky and sick, I began to descend the ladder. Finally, I was back on the ground, but I fought a long way from safe. The soldiers fixed me with hard stares. As one continued to cover me, the other snapped. What are you doing here? Uh, voluntary work, I managed to answer, helping fix the fire tower up. 
The soldiers shared a look. I got the feeling that they weren't convinced I was an innocent hearer. I tried to explain. I was up in the deck speaking to another one of the volunteers, a um, bath on my phone when I noticed that something was wrong. So I filmed the smoke over by the secret military facility and the zombies. Only until I dropped my phone. I stopped talking, realizing any chance that I might have had of them letting me go had gone. Because of my big mouth. Because I was a loser. One of the soldiers grabbed my arm and said sharply, You're coming with us. I started to protest to tell them that this was a free country and that they couldn't treat me like this. But then my arm was pulled tightly up behind my back and the soldier snarled at me to be quiet. I was in too much pain to speak anyway and couldn't resist as I was manhandled into the back of the jeep. One of the soldiers clambered in next to me. The other threw the zombie in the trunk, got behind the wheel and then started the engine and we were off. A radio in the front crackled with bursts of animated chatter as we clattered along the forest floor. It was these soldiers in different vehicles communicating with each other, I realized. They sounded stoked at dispatching the zombies. It didn't seem very disciplined to me and made me even more worried about my own fate. I had been detained by a bunch of yeehaw and grunts and my civil rights were being stomped into dust. But then a new voice came over the radio. Alpha 4 calling. We've got a problem here. One of the bogeys that we're transporting was not tapped in the brain. I'm trying to get through to the cab. It's... But nothing more was said. There was a moment of static bleeding out from the radio. And then the screaming began. It was hideous to hear, but the silence that followed was somehow worse. The soldier next to me swore under his breath and we traveled on as a request for Alpha 4 to report their status was transmitted over the radio. After a couple of minutes, the driver of the jeep exclaimed, Up ahead. He braked. I looked over his shoulder. An army truck was stopped at an angle in front of us. Its front had collided with a tree, but its engine was still running. Tendrils of smoke rose from the bonnet. Stay here, the soldier next to me said and climbed out of the jeep. The driver did the same. And they began to approach the truck which suddenly lurched backwards. Its wheels threw up dirt as it reversed along the forest floor and then turned so that it was facing us. My guts tightened. There was a zombie at the wheel. A grin spread across its grotesque face. The engine roared and the truck began to speed towards us. The soldier nearest fired, shattering the windscreen of the truck which swerved before stuttering to a halt. I could see the zombie staring blindly out. Red from the fresh wound in its forehead was splattered against the inside of the cracked windscreen. The other soldier got on the radio, called in the details and requested a tow truck and a cleanup crew. And then we were off again. We followed a rough path littered with snapped off branches. One made, I guessed, as the convoy rushed in pursuit of the zombies. And now they seemed to be heading back from where they came. A while later, a group of buildings appeared as suddenly in the clearing of the forest. They looked like industrial buildings. Long squat boxes with roller shutter doors and vents at intervals along their flat roofs. As best as I could see, they were connected by covered walkways. If I had seen this complex on a regular day by the side of the highway, it was the type of place which would have passed anonymously by in the background. But on this strangest of days in the middle of nowhere, it loomed ahead of me an ominous presence. As we came closer, the driver spoke into the radio. Bravo 16 requesting entry. A reply came a heartbeat later when a shutter door in the nearest building rattled open and we drove into a vast open space. My senses were attacked by dozens of voices all shouting at once, by lights which felt painfully bright after the shade-dappled forest floor. 
by the sharp alerts of vehicles backing up and by the clump of bodies being thrown out of the back of trucks. Bile rose into the back of my throat as I realized it was the remains of the zombies. I was still reeling from this sight when the jeep had stopped. I was dragged from it and marched away. I had never been in a police station, but I had watched enough reality shows about cops when I was wallowing in the wake of my marriage breakup to recognize the things that I was being taken to. It was a row of cells. Though cages would be a better way to describe them, four of them side by side, constructed by metal bars. A guard opened up one of the cells and I was pushed inside. The door slammed to close behind me and a lock bolted in place. I sank to the ground, my back against the cold hard bars and hugged my knees to my chest. Through the gaps in the bars, I could still see and hear the frenzy of activity filing in the building. I was left alone though, a bystander, a prisoner, but I was not alone for long. I was wishing that I had stayed in my apartment, watching garbage TV and eating pizza, and I'd never heard of the fire tower when I heard a sound which sent chills down my spine. A growl. I looked up. A zombie was being pulled towards the cells. Its neck was held in a collar attached to a long pole which was gripped by a soldier. It was the type of thing that would be used to capture and move a feral dog. The zombie foamed at the mouth and thrashed against its restraint, but the soldier managed to get it up to the cell next to mine. The cell had already been unlocked by a guard who clearly wanted to keep his distance from the zombie. The soldier pushed the zombie inside, threw the pole in after it, and the cell was locked. The soldier and the guard high-fived each other and walked away. Wait, I called after them. You can't leave me here with that. They both gave me the finger and kept walking. I looked at my new neighbor through the bars which were all that divided us. The zombie wore a soldier's uniform and I wondered if it had been on board Alpha 4 and turned by their rogue passenger. Was that why it hadn't been dispatched by a bullet to the brain? Whatever the reason, it had been spared, it was there, and it was deranged. Flecks of spittle flew from its cracked lips as it shuffled around its cell, groaning and shaking its head. Lost in its fury, the zombie did not seem to have noticed me, so I tried to keep it that way by not moving a muscle. I failed. I started to shake uncontrollably all over. My teeth started to chatter. I couldn't stop. In the other cell, the zombie started growling. It raised its head slowly and it looked at me. It was aware of me now. Its bloodshot eyes shone with anger. A low growl once more began to drift from its mouth and it took a step towards me. I clambered to my feet and stumbled backwards until I reached the far end of my cell, where I watched in horror as the zombie shuffled closer. It reached the bars that stood between us and roared in frustration that its way was blocked. It forced a hand through a gap in the bars, scraping off its own skin and leaving raw flesh beneath. Its fingers had clawed at the air. Reason would have told me that there was no way it could get through, but I wasn't thinking straight. I was terrified, and at first I didn't notice that the door to my cell was being opened. I only realized when the zombie turned its murderous gaze towards the guard who had opened it up, and the man who was stepping past him into my cell. He had a buzz cut, a square jaw, and no neck as far as I could see. Slabs of muscle bulged under a uniform, on the collars of which a star stood out. He looked at the zombie and drawled. I'll deal with you later after I've had a conversation with this civilian. And then he turned to me, narrowed his eyes, and said, I've had a bad day, son. The facility is compromised, so I'm shutting it down and clearing the place out. It'll be like we were never here if anybody goes bleeding to the press. As for you, your phone was recovered from the scene. It was still working. The nerds here unlocked it, and I saw the film. 
which means you know too much and have been designated a threat to national security. You and your girlfriend are a loose end that needs tying up. She's not my girlfriend, was all that I managed to say before something sharp stuck my arm. I looked down to see the syringe and then the cell began to spin around me. The next thing I knew I was opening my eyes. Everything was blurred. I felt sick, groggy, and I had no idea where I was or how I had got there. I rubbed my eyes and my vision began to clear. I was lying next to a woman with long dark hair. It was Beth. For a moment I thought that I was having a wonderful dream and then I saw that we were lying on the floor of the observation deck. This was not a dream. It was a waking nightmare from which there was no escape. Beth opened her eyes and put her hand to her forehead. Sons of a... She exclaimed hoarsely. I got a text from you at the end of my shift saying the area had been declared safe and that you needed me to come to the fire tower. I was worried and so I drove straight out here. But when I arrived, the soldiers grabbed me and injected me. I echoed her curse and then said, It was a trap. They must have used my phone. They're experimenting with zombies, Beth, and think that you know about it as well. They want to cover it all up. She sat up and there was steel in her voice when she said, No way, we're getting out of here. I must admit at that moment in time, I had never been more attracted to Beth. Call it hormones, call it the fact that I was having a crazy day or that I had just been drugged, but I had to tell her that I liked her there and then. I began to say, Beth, I, until she talked over me asking, Can you smell that? I focused and could smell something. It was the smell of burning. Beth was already on her feet and moving towards the barrier. I followed and together we peered over the side. We swore in unison. The base of the fire tower was in flames, the legs were being engulfed and the ladder consumed. I'll phone 911, Beth told me and reached into the back pocket of her jeans. Her face fell and she said, ah, The soldiers must have taken my phone. They've left us stranded. And they set the fire to make it look like our deaths were accidental. I added grimly. As I spoke, burning embers drifted up past my face. The fire was only minutes away from reaching the observation deck. I felt a tear run down my face. This was it. I was going to die. The sound of wood crackling and spitting filled the air as a high-pitched noise rose and fell in the distance. From her expression, Beth had heard it as well. She punched the air and cried out, Go Mike! And then she turned to me and said, I had called Mike when I got the message that I thought was from you. He said that he would head out as well. He must be nearby and had seen the fire and called his old buddies at the fire service. Oh, we're saved, I exclaimed. Beth high-fived me. Saved, she echoed. Just before a loud crack sounded below us and the deck rocked violently, almost knocking me off my feet. The legs are giving way, Beth yelled. The sound of the siren was getting louder, but even if the fire service arrived in the next 30 seconds, they would be too late. And then I saw a car emerge from the forest and screech to a halt. Mike jumped out. He started to run for the fire tower, but the flames forced him back. It was hopeless. There was nothing that anyone could do. And then I heard the dull clump of a helicopter's blades and span around. A chopper marked with the fire service's insignia was heading over the forest canopy. It reached the deck, hovered over us, and a figure appeared in one of the doors. They began to descend on a line, reaching us moments later. A harness was looped around Bath and she was lifted. I watched her ascend. Another crack, another violent tilt of the deck sent me sprawling. I rolled onto my back and watched as the figure was lowered back down towards me. The harness went around me and I was lifted off the deck, just in time. Below me, the deck collapsed and fell into the inferno. I must have passed out because the next thing I knew, I was lying on the ground. The air was thick with smoke and there was a fire truck parked up on one side of me. And Beth was there kneeling over me, a look of concern on her face. 
Welcome back, she said. I coughed and said, We made it. We did, she replied, and now we're safe. I'm trying to remember, was there something that you were going to say to me before we realized that the tower was on fire? My throat suddenly felt dry and it was nothing to do with the smoke and the heat. Uh, yeah. I wanted to tell you that I really like you and well. I was wondering if you would want to go out with me. Beth smiled and answered, Hey, it's Saturday night. Let's go for a cold beer and I'll think about it. And that worked just fine with me.